Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mathieu Jacomi. I come from Paris in France and I work in uh, the biggest school of social, uh, political sciences named Sciences Po. And here there is um, a laboratory named the Media Lab, um, which is a hybrid laboratory where researchers, engineers and designers work together to, let's, let's say, study the social. I don't want to dig too much in the details, but Let's say I'm, I'm sort of social uh, data scientist, if you want. So I work with researchers, and they come with um, research questions and data, and I help them deal with, uh, for instance, the technicality of the digital data, but also the question <coughs> is matching the specificities of the data with their research interest. So the, the tool I will present is quite simple, and the idea is quite straightforward, but What's important is the, the, the fact that you have an exploration step in what we do. And exploring data is not about the classic um, statistical metrics. Because most of the time you don't know what you search for, or you don't know exactly. So the perspective we are in is um, very well explained by John Ducky, who was a statistician, in case you don't know him. Uh, he wrote a famous book named Exploratory Data Analysis. And so the first quote is very telling uh, on that matter. The greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see, like about serendipity, unexpected things in the data, which is very important for social scientists. And I like a lot this other quote. <coughs> Far better an approximate answer to the right question which is often vague, than an exact answer to the wrong question, which can always be made precise. So the point, my, the, the whole point of the tool is helping you finding what is the right question. You probably know already that very famous uh, image. So it's Ben Fry, he invented the Protovis uh, language, and he explains that the chain from data mining to visualization has different steps. But they don't only go left to right. Sometimes you, you have to go back. Okay? So it's about iterating facet of the data. In particular, in the middle of this image, you have the filter mine represent and then go back to filtering. This loop, this central loop, is very relevant to us because um, when you have a CSV, which, which is quite a simple format, uh, to read and to parse and, to, and to, to put into the computer. You are mostly somewhere here. You already have the data and then you want to, to dig into the data. You want to filter and you want to mine the data. Represent it. You have many ways to do so. But then most of the time you realize that you don't, you don't have the right question. Then you have to go back to filter and you have to tinker and to search for that. So with CSV we have a first problem. It's that the tools, most of the tools, uh, require a painful coding. So LibreOffice, Excel, OpenRefine, they all allow you to code, but the coding features are embedded somewhere. They are secondary, and they are embedded in the graphical user interface, and they are designed for non-coders. Like if with graphical interface, you would not be obliged to deal with coding, but when, once you have Complicated data and complicated research question, you have complicated filtering. And only coding allows you to do that. So you still have to code. So my observation is that you, as a non-coder, you, you, you lose your time learning how to code in LibreOffice because it's complicated and it's non-standard, it's broken, it's limited. So why not doing it with a real uh, language? So let, let me give you an example. This is exactly the, the kind of example you presented before. I just downloaded that from the internet. It's the rank, m ranking of movies. And you have many different quirks. So first, the rating is with this divided by 10 uh, chain. That is not relevant. You just have the rating. But more bizarre, you have the, the years encoded inside the title of the movies, which is somehow makes sense, but it's, it's not uh, easy to deal with us. You have to parse the data. Let's do that in, in LibreOffice. You can do it in one formula, or at least I don't know how to do it. So you have to use this first column to find where the, the, the year begins, and then use a second column to compute the substring, which means you have an additional column that is not really relevant, but you can't get rid of that. And also, you have very strange things. 
So because I'm French, my computer is in French, so LibreOffice translates the, the keywords of the language in French. So instead of having search, you have search, which is the French word for search. So this is like, what the fuck? If I'm working with, with, <laughs> with students and I, they copy paste in my code, it doesn't work on their computer because they're Italian and English or whatever. So this is the quirks of having a, a secondary language embedded inside something. So the GUI, the graphical uh, perspective of that spreadsheet <coughs> is a limit here in, in its problem. So if you just had JavaScript, you just write a line of code. It looks like complicated if, you're not, if you don't know how to code, but because this is a regular expression, but if you really look at the LibreOffice version, you still have a regular expression because you can't do another way, so it's still complicated. So This works well as soon as you can put your CSV inside a coding environment. Let's say you know Python, you, you, you load your CSV, you, you do your filtering, and then you, you, you save another CSV which is clean. But then you want to visualize it. You have to put it inside, let's say, Excel or LibreOffice or Tableau software, and then you realize, you remember the loop, you realize that your filtering was not adapted, so you edit your filtering, you, you save it again, and you reopen it in, inside the software, and this is complicated. So this is the, the problem number two. There's a gap between the coding, uh, and I mean filtering and editing the CSV, and visualizing it. So for instance, inside Tableau Public, and the, the software is amazing if you want to craft co uh, complex, sophisticated visualization and you, you, don't, you really know what you want. But if you just want to filter your simple CSV because you want to look at a specific facet, you can filter, but you have to open a model by a drag and, drag and drop and then go to a tab, and then in a form you can paste your formula. And then once you, you close and you save your filter, you, have, you see the visualization. But each time you want to do it again, it's very complicated. One of the issues is that the model, the panel, is hiding the visualization. So you have many steps to open it, edit your filter, and then go back to visualization. So iterations are painful as well. So that's why CSV rinse repeat is just a way to shorten that gap. And you have a panel for coding, and you have a panel for visualization. It's not, very, it's not as good as Tableau public to visualize but you just have enough so that you can code and see live what happens to your data. So it's an open source tool. It's a, simple, a single web app. So you just have, you, you load it and then you can deal with it. Uh, you have a standard JavaScript coding panel. You can import and export your CSV. You have a basic preview of the CSV. It's very basic, but you can still uh, use it. And you have a, a layout designed to get rid of the filter this gap. That is, you have the two panels at the same time, coding and visualizing. So let me show that to you. So unfortunately, I think I don't really have internet. So, ah, yes. Nice. Let's load the same. So this is the web page. You can just uh, you can look at this by yourself. You have the examples. And the first example movie is, is the same I, I, sh I have shown before. Is it readable? I'm not really. Can I do something better? You can read it. It's fine. So, I'm sorry. I'll sit down. Um, you see here, so you have, basically, you have a panel and that you can resize when you need it. And you have this uh, preview. You have three random rows that you can reroll, or you can choose more rows. And you have here 1,000 rows in your original CSV. And let's, let's code something trivial, like output is just the input. And then you have exactly the same thing. And you can add some visualizations, like, I don't know, the, the top words inside uh, the movies. So you see that the top words are dead, Harry, star, life, whatever. OK, so what's interesting is to, let's, let's do it again. So what we can do is clean up the data. So here I'm doing this. I'm writing a column named year where you have the, the extraction of the year from the movie title. Then I'm cleaning the movie title by removing the space, parentheses, and uh, whatever, the year. And also I'm removing the divided by 10 from the rating. And if you look at, let's forget about that for now. 
And then I have like a clean CSV and I can just use that as a quick way to, to clean my CSV and download it and open it in LibreOffice and you will see the, the columns are, are clean. You, you, you can visualize the year here and whatever. And in the, in the example, you can filter, not, so you can clean your data and then you can filter it. So for instance, here we are just focusing on movies which have a number in their title, which you could not do before because you had the year, so you always had a number. And you can look at which kind of films have a number. And okay. So this is like a very trivial example. But I want to do something better. So I have, I downloaded this morning a very big CSV. So it's a CSV about uh, it's tweets containing Shakespeare that we indexed for um, since a, a moment. So now it's slower, but you have, the data request is quite big. You have 170,000 tweets, so 170,000 columns. And in this column, you have a lot of different things, including the, the, the text of the tweet, the date, the user, and, and more things. So now let's, let's imagine you want to see what's inside the data, and you want to do a lot of iterations. So the first thing you want to do is, let's look at the time. And I know it's interesting. So I choose to the daily volume, and the date comes from the, the created at column. And then you see the evolution of the number of tweets every day since the beginning of the data set. And see that there, there's a very big peak around um, uh, the 23 of April. So I just propose to look at that peak. So let's write the code. We have two dates. So the dates here are, it's complicated to deal with dates. You know, look at the format. Here you have, you're on JavaScript, so it's quite easy. You define two dates with a normal format. And then you, the JavaScript knows how to parse these dates. And you can just look for the tweets where uh, the date of the tweet is after date one and before date two. And then you, you control enter. It's filtering your data. You can look at how many remaining tweets you have, uh, 48,000. And then you see, you look at the, the peak. So let's look at the um, top words. Let's look at the top words inside these tweets. Here they are. And you have things like number seven is death, the number 12 is died, and number 13 is anniversary. So this peak corresponds to the date of the death, the, four, the, the 400th uh, anniversary of the death of Shakespeare. And so now we'd like to know, for instance, so what's, what's, what's the difference between what we say, what people say about Shakespeare before. So we can just edit the filter. So now I just want the tweets before the beginning of the peak and look at if they already talk about the death of Shakespeare, for instance. So you have now the curve before the peak. And you can see that. So death is now number 20. So there is a shift here. And we can iterate over the filtering by searching for how many uh, research questions we want. So for instance, there is a Cervantes thing here. So who is speaking about Cervantes? We, maybe we can just filter that. So this is done this way. Item, this is my tweet, dot text, dot search for Cervantes. And if it's found, and then I'm searching for the tweets before the date, which have Cervantes in their, in their uh, tweets. So if you don't know what it's about, you can just look at some of the, of the tweets to, to get an idea. So this is exploration. So it's about looking at that. So for instance, you have these tweets. And I don't understand them because most of them are in Spanish. So here I, I found an hypothesis during my exploration. So maybe Cervantes is about Spanish. And we can test that. So let's look at the languages, because I have languages in the, in, the, in the tweets. So let's look at the main languages. Languages is encoded here. And so Spanish has two, more than 2,000 tweets with Cervantes 
and English is second with like 10 times less. Let's say I remove the Cervantes condition from my filter to look at if this difference is from the whole data set or not. And then you realize that actually English is like seven, eight times more present than, than Spanish. So it's like if only the Spanish speakers are interested in the fact that Cervantes has a link with Shakespeare. So which is the link? And this is a, the final very good story for today, is that they both died the same day, which is supposedly the, the, the 23 of April, except that for Shakespeare, it's in the Julian calendar. So the real date is the 3 of May, it's today. But what's weird is that today, we, we don't have uh, any peak. So I, I expected to see the peak today as well, like for the year 2000, but it's not there. Just let me check if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So we are not tweeting, or maybe not yet. Maybe later in the day we will see a peak about uh, Shakespeare. So let's, these were my backup slides, and let's wrap up this pre presentation. So the main, the most important point to me is that exploration requires iterating, and the the, more, the shorter the iteration process, the more you can try to to match research questions with the features of the field data. So that's why CSV is repeated about constantly rewriting your filters. It requires to be able to code in JavaScript. But it's not a complicated language. You have a lot of help if you want to learn that, and it's useful. So the visualizations are basic. You can't do everything you want. The preview is not comfortable. That's OK, because you have other tools to deal with that. Here, it's just about shortening the gap. So it's a simple tool. And once you have your hypothesis, you, you, you go out of your exploration phase. Like, I know that there is something happening with the Spanish and Cervantes, and I know I want to, to to dig into the Spanish uh, tweets versus the English tweets. And then you can like, go in Tableau software, and once you have your hypothesis, visualize exactly that aspect of the data and craft a better visualization with adapted tools, or do uh, metrics like, uh, at, at which, which is the, the p-value of this, this, whatever. That's it, you just switch to another tool. Uh, thank you for your attention. Have some questions. Yeah. Do you intend to keep it uh, to, to keep what you created as a tool to explore data, or do you want to add more functionalities? And, uh, I mean, uh, are you also maybe planning to make it open source so people can contribute so to it? It's open source. It's on GitHub already. Okay. Uh, you can contribute, and I also encourage you to to contribute because I. Like, adding visualization is quite easy. It's, so the, the global uh, structure is in Angular. So you, you have a component named cards, and you just add cards, and it adds visualization cards. Uh, you, and the, or the existing cards are commented in the code so that you can just look at them. The visualization are just in D3, uh, like the standard visualization in JavaScript. And, um, and you can post issues and so on. But I want to keep it uh, um, about exploration, because you have many people wanting to, to, to produce visualization is fine. But it's not the, I mean, at one point, one of the software will be the standards, it would be awesome, and I can't compete with my, my small workforce with Tableau, for instance. So it's more reasonable to focus on one aspect, but it's better to also to, like CSV is a good vessel to, to, to transfer data from one place to another. So let's multiply different tools for different uses and think that as a toolbox, I think it's better we don't have a lot of energy in research. We have the engineering time in research is, is low, so that's how we do it. And also, I, I forgot to say that, except if you, except if you use the mapping uh, card viz, which, open, which uses open layers, and maybe it sends information, no data is uploaded. So here, the, data, the, the CSV is like 100 megabytes, and it's just in local, it, on your computer. No data is sent, you can just keep it at home, uh, there is no server. It's just pure JavaScript client side. Like your, your data is safe. So on that topic, I mean, 100 megabytes is pretty impressive. But um, what kinds, what sizes of data sets have you seen people using this with? Like, know, effectively, where is it going to tap out? Uh, like, so it depends on how many rows versus how many columns. 
but like half a gigabyte yeah. still works. And I think that the more efficient our, the browsers are, mm -hmm. uh, the better the, the limit improves by itself just because yeah. they deal better with memory and so on. Are there any uh, other tools that the Sciences Media Lab offers? Oh, yes, sure. If I do, I have internet. So, on tools.medialab.science-po.fr, you have a list of our tools. One of the other tools that is relevant to people working with CSV on who want to extract networks is table to net It's another of my tools. All of them are on GitHub open source. So I, I, I don't have the time to make a presentation of that, and it would require to talk about networks, but basically you upload a CSV. I don't know, let's upload the, the same CSV. And then you can choose which column you want to match as nodes and edges <coughs> to produce a network, download the network, and then visualize it in another software like Giphy or so on. So the toolbox, the toolbox spirit. Feel free to look at them. Yes. Um, you showed us you were exporting the filtered CSV. Can you also export the the visualizations? So I did not finish to, to implement that in, in all of them, but in most of them you have in some, um, so this, this one is just text, you can copy paste it, but uh, so for instance this one which is com quite complicated, I think you can download it, yes. So you download the CSV and once I have more time I will put that, that feature in all the, the vis as a standard. Other questions? Yes? Uh, what kind of data format does this system support for the data source? That's because a just a CSV? CSV? Yeah. yeah, because we have some problems with CSV files. I mean, they have crappy CSV files. So. I would love to have, because I work with data scientists, and as you said, they, they don't realize what they talk about, actually. So you, you get a file, and most of the time you have to clean it before making it compatible with that, like putting it in UTF-8 or whatever. I would love to have a small tool one day, I will make it if no one else does, who says in very clear words that what, what is the CSV okay or has, has it issues with uh, like, you know, new line or separators or like, is your CSV with a semicolon separator, for instance, because it comes from Excel? Like just having a feedback for user so that I can say, okay, you put first your file in that tool and then tell me what it says, and if it's bad, then re re redo it until it's good. <coughs> really use useful, because the most of your time you lose is not about writing that, it's about accompanying people to learn, to teach them like the procedures of the, the digital. That's fine, thank you very much.